committee and good morning, Gus and Ella and, and Nick. Um, they're going to be with us for a few minutes here early on. And uh, I uh, somehow on the schedule, Gus, you got on first before uh, before Nick. So unless you want to change uh, your order, uh, we'll follow the schedule. That's not my ugly dog that's barking. You're Even muted, though. Gus. I didn't know if you were barking at us. <laughs> <laughs> Gus, you're muted. There we go. Yeah. Good morning. So I'm up first. Is it Mr. Chairman? Yes, if, if you prefer that. If not, you can pass it off to any one of us or... Nick, or maybe Mella would speak for you. Um, well, I'll just be very brief because, you know, I, I think our section of the bill you're looking at is on page 22. Yeah. And I think the language you've written works just fine for us. And if Ella has any additions, she will speak up now. Um, you know, we, I am sure that uh, if additional fund, we wanted to make a modest request that we knew would get out the door as we talk to people, there's lots of interest in supporting farmers in this time. And we're happy to do a little more, but we also wanted to provide a modest request here. The only other thing I'll, I'll just mention um, today, and it may not fit into this bill, but we'd given you some language some time ago that we thought might go in the ag housekeeping bill that would make us eligible to apply for some federal funds that we're not currently viewed as eligible for. And if yeah. this bill is going to go faster, we'd love to see it move, but you may not want to do that. Um, well, no, that, um, I talked with Jane about that and we may have it in, in our first quarter language, but if you would send that, I mean, it's all it does is make you eligible to apply for more, uh, grants, I believe. That's correct. Yeah. And if you wanted to send that, or do you have that language, Michael? I do. I, I drafted it up for uh, the amendment to 656. I can just pull it out and uh, have it separate and send it to Stephanie uh, for inclusion in the in the first quarter, if you want. Well, I, I are think we hoping we, this goes faster. We could tuck it right in this, just add it to this bill as well. And whichever one goes through first would have it in it and, and we'll scratch it on the other bills. Okay, we'll do. And um, so um, Gus, you want to give us, or, or Ella, give us a, is that the language that we'd have to add? No, no. Um, uh, maybe you could uh, send the committee members a copy of that, Michael, so they could look it over, you know, if uh, later. And so we'll have it for tomorrow. Sure, I'll do that right now. Yeah. Um, maybe quickly uh, you could run through what you're planning on doing. Uh, with this uh, additional uh, funds, Gus or Ella? Well, why don't we turn that over to Ella and she can just uh, remind you of the presentation we made a week or two ago, but fundamentally we will be using consultants and some viability providers to uh, do rapid response work with farmers and she can tell you how much we've already done, uh, but we don't have funding for it past June 30th. So we'd be looking at needing help from July through December. So I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Ella to just talk about um, how she's geared up the rapid response work. Yeah, thanks, Gus. Welcome, Ella. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us this morning. And we, can't, for we can't, or I can't hear you very well. Okay, hold on just a second. Do you have a, a headphone or something plugged in? It sounded like there was a mic far away from you. 
No, is that, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, I think it's switching between Zoom and Microsoft Teams gets messes up the system. So thanks for having us. And um, I'll be really brief because I think you've heard a fair bit about this already. Uh, with that 192, like I said, we'd use a combination of largely consultants, but possibly also some of our viability partners, staff um, time to provide one to six hours as needed for anything sort of business related that helps folks uh, respond to the situations or uh, really get back on track with business recovery. Um, it's a real wide range of activities. Uh, so far, we've helped uh, probably about 100 businesses over the past five weeks. Um, and particularly, um, particularly with financial planning and applying for federal and state relief funds and unemployment, but also uh, many of the, those over a quarter of them shifting markets to retail or online sales, um, as well as some work around food safety, regulatory situations, and then sort of health and well-being and mental health services. So we're partnering with Farm First, which you're familiar with, as well as the Vermont Ag Mediation Program, and then about you know eight or 10 of our network partners, Intervale, UVM, NOFA, um, the Center for Agricultural Economy and others uh, who are all in touch with farm and food businesses as well as uh, forestry sector businesses. So we really did open this up across to working lands businesses, not just farmers. Um, we're doing some work with many of the slaughter and meat processing facilities around the state through the Sustainable Jobs Fund and their partnership. So um, funding a lot of different pieces at the moment and trying to make just uh, you know, easy access to those consultants and organizations. Um, so the 192, like I said, would really enable that capacity to continue July, uh, July through December. And um, we may end up looking for additional resources beyond that as our partners identify new programming and educational uh, support they want to provide to businesses. But this will really um, enable us to continue that rapid response coaching uh, for that six month period. And we'd work with at least 300 businesses during that time frame. I would invite you to consider adding um, in that uh, in that section eight um, on page 22 of the bill, uh, consider adding not just farms, but food businesses or ag related businesses, since we do think that businesses such as small food distributors and uh, particularly slaughter and meat processing or other types of agricultural processing businesses may need our support as well. And yeah. alternatively, you could also open it up to working lands businesses and then support that 192 could go towards some of the forestry sector businesses that we're also supporting right now. So you're getting requests from these people already and but yet you don't have the authority to to help. Is there any problem with uh, any committee member have a problem adding that to uh, to that section? So we'll have Michael fill that in. You did you have a question, Chris? Yeah, just you mentioned, you know, this kind of maintains your capacity and uh, I'm you're you're this has got to be the most modest uh, line item request we've heard in the last month. Um, and I guess I'm a little more interested than just maintaining your capacity and if there was an ability to reach 500 businesses if that's realistic with capacity, I sure would like to understand that number um, and, and just invite you to help us see how much we can ramp up. I mean, you, you do, as I understand it, the work does fall across a, lot, a broad range of partners and actually was something that was under demand before the crisis. Um, and so main, maintenance of effort doesn't seem to quite fit the challenge here. I'm, I wonder if you could comment. Sure. Um, so I agree. <laughs> I think that um, we've been trying to judge, you know, every week feels a little different right now, every day. Um, we've been trying to judge sort of what capacity can be, uh, can be deployed essentially between consultants and organizations and um, also trying to understand from each of our partner organizations where they would like to spend extra capacity for COVID relief work during that specific timeframe. Um, since 
we're trying to help them identify where COVID relief dollars could be utilized and where it's actually truly eligible. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of misinformation or, or just lack of information for a lot of folks who are thinking about that but haven't really dug into the details. So we've been helping articulate what that eligibility could look like, what activities would be eligible, and getting uh, sort of small asks from each of our partners in the range of like nine to forty thousand um, dollars. And I'm still uh, having a couple of our partners work through those essentially proposals to us, and we're planning on sort of putting that package together of beyond that 192, what else could we deploy during that six month period? And it's looking like about 150 to $200,000 additional above and beyond the 192 uh, with sort of small awards to each of those relatively small, I mean, $40,000 would go a long way to helping the Sustainable Jobs Fund, for example, work with about 16 to 20 businesses sort of more in depth than that sort of six hours but really, really look at pivoting businesses, structures, and markets significantly um, over that time period. So uh, we are gathering that information and prepared to deploy additional resources and preparing to deploy additional resources. We yep. could end up applying for that money under an RFP with ACCD, um, or if there's other opportunities to have some of that funding a little earlier and know that it's coming, we'd get those services out faster. Sarah, is there any I, any way of of checking on how many how many dollars that you generated for the candidates that you visited with uh, from our you know our little investment or your little investment into uh, helping? Yeah, we're we're I mean with our sort of rapid response work, we're not at the moment collecting data like sales data on sort of a week to week or month to month basis, but we do plan to do some look back with clients. I think where we, it, everybody's in such an unknown territory right now. Um, so I, I think you're asking about metrics that we're seeing yeah. already. And um, we could collect a little bit of data from the sort of hundred businesses that we've been working with over the past five weeks. Um, we've been trying not to ask too much of those business operators in that no. short time period. So we, no, have, we don't have that data now. I think that's probably wise. I mean, their plate is, you know, stuff's falling off their plate, it's so full and there's no need to burden them with more. Uh, if, you know, if we just had a ballpark figure because sometime in, in some instances we get asked, well, yeah, you're spending 192000 and is there any return on this? And it's it's nice to be able to say, yeah, and this this is it, and and this is where the numbers came from, even if they're ballpark numbers. I I wouldn't bother the the client so to get numbers, but you know, if you help somebody get unemployment which they hadn't and wasn't going to re get that, you know, that's uh, anywhere from six to a thousand dollars a week. And so it adds up quick, but uh, Ruth. Yeah. Thanks Bobby. Um, and thanks Ella and Gus. Um, I think I asked this question before, but I, I just want to reiterate it, I guess, to make sure I understand. So we have heard direct testimony from larger dairy farmers that are medium and, and large farm operations that one of the most helpful types of technical assistance they could use right now is, you know, business and finance consulting or technical assistance. Um, and these are large operations where millions of dollars go through every year. Um, and I've heard from lots of smaller operations and small farms that your services are excellent and extremely helpful, but at the larger end that are more potentially complicated and have a lot more uh, moving parts, the, the, the reviews are not as strong. So I'm just wondering what your capacity is or what your, who would you send these people to um, 
uh, do you work with Yankee Farm Credit or some organizations like that? Or, or what do you do for these larger dairy operations? Sure. Um, so we've worked with most of the medium farm operations in the state. That tends to be a good fit. But LFOs tend to be of a scale, um, both sort of management-wise and financially, that they have their own financial advisors on retainer and utilize a company like Deem Associates, for example. So we do partner with Deem Associates. We've paid them once in a while when an LFO or a MFO wants to use their services but doesn't quite have the financial capacity to do so. So in some cases, a couple of times over the past five or six years, we've subsidized that to help a, a, a larger dairy farm get started with a company like Deem Associates. Uh, one of their staff, uh, Dan Zhang, um, is going to start doing some consulting through our uh, rapid response coaching for us so that we have somebody on the team who's very familiar with working with larger MFOs. Certainly, um, some of our folks at UVM Extension have worked with some of those farms uh, as well, particularly on aspects like succession, where the financial service providers like Dean Associates don't, don't do that kind of coaching and don't have that kind of expertise. So um, we tend to provide the LFOs more with succession and uh, um, or uh, help getting other kinds of enterprises started on their on their business. Um, so yeah, we sort of fit in the nooks and crannies that that you know where the sort of typical uh, financial support services that are that are paid for that are private sector uh, don't necessarily touch. So, um, so and we do also you work with Yankee uh, and trade clients back and forth there also. And uh, Johanna Lidback who does consulting for them has also consulted for us. So yeah, generally most of the sort of financial and business general planning is supported by the private sector for the larger businesses. And it's not just the case with dairy; it's the case with other kinds of businesses, depending on sort of both the sophistication of the management and the sort of financial scale that um, that paying those companies directly. And we don't want to take business away from the private sector also. So, uh, you know, that's a natural tension there. So, yeah, we fit more in the in, in between around new markets and new enterprises and succession um, in that way. And then, but we, but we do have relationships with those companies that do do more of that typical financial planning uh, work with larger and, and, and we'll refer back and forth with them. Okay, great. Yeah. And I'm assuming also you work with um, cheese makers and, and dairy processors, because that's another area that's really struggling um, right now. Yes, I think we've worked over the past like 15 years, I think we've worked with almost every cheese maker in the state practically, right. maybe at least 75% of them, particularly at the, as they've ramped up their scale or gotten new enterprises or new products off the ground. Um, at, certainly, and we see some of them come back around when they're looking to build a new, a new facility, for example, is usually a time that they come back to our program. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, other questions from uh, committee members for Gus or Ella? No? Well, I thank you. Go ahead, Gus. Just if the committee wants to, you know, enhance the proposal by one hundred fifty thousand dollars, we certainly, you know, can report back to you when you get to the next budget in August if we're having any difficulty getting those dollars out the door. And I think the um, the language Ella proposed, um, which I think you were about to take a poll on, Mr. Chairman, will just broaden whom we can serve, and we certainly would be happy sent. Uh, to uh, just make clear to the large farms that probably are having cash flow issues now because of all that's gone on that uh, we could help support the consulting that they already probably have on contract, but probably are feeling quite tight about uh, spending extra dollars on right now. Yeah, um, well, we, you know, we're running under um, a cat budget, you might call it. And if we can get the money, that extra 150 or 200 from someplace else, I'd, I'd like to keep as much of our money going direct to uh, the farms uh, as we can and, and get the extra money uh, from some other spot, you know, along the way. But we'll, we, we'll talk about that and if it looks uh, like like there is no other spot to get it from, uh, I mean, if we can 
if we can spend say 150,000, but it saves uh, a, a half a million dollar farm and keeps them in operation, uh, you know, that's very important. Uh, so I think we'll discuss that and, and then, you know, decide which, which way is the most sensible way uh, to move forward. Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to push one way or the other, only to say I'm very happy for us to take more on if you ask us to. Um, as Ella indicated, the commerce package has $5 million of technical assistance in it. So um, we can also apply to them at a later date. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Ella? I just wanted to mention, I'm just looking at some of our data um, uh, of the folks who we've done this rapid response work with. And so far, 53% of them have been dairy farms, 20% have been diversified produce and livestock farms, and about 6% have been logging and wood products businesses, and, um, and then a variety of in between. And I just thought that that might be helpful information to give, you know, we're, we're certainly largely working with dairy farms right now. Yeah. Well, they're really hurting, that's for sure. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, are you guys going to stay on while Nick's with us? Yeah. Good. Um, well, we'll switch to Nick. And um, I know I you sent out a, a release the other day that you're helping uh, with some relief on on some conserved farms, and maybe you're going to fill us in on that along with other issues, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Chairman Starr. And just, uh, I guess, for the record, I'll introduce myself, Nick Richardson, President and CEO of the Vermont Land Trust. It's really good to be with you all this morning. Um, you know, I, too, would wish that we were doing this in person, but it's great that we're continuing to get, get the work done um, together in this way. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do want to, um, I'll spend some time talking about our uh, and bring you up to date on our COVID recovery and response fund, um, which we see as a complement and an important um, additional support along with the programs that we just spent time talking about. And um, in particular, I think the work that um, the Farm and Forest Viability Program at VHCB is doing is just essential uh, at this moment. And we'll come back and sort of spend some more time talking about that in my testimony. Um, I think there are, uh, you know, there are a huge number of needs out there right now. We all know this. You guys are spending a lot of time um, listening to and understanding and wrapping your arms around uh, the complexity and the scale of the challenge that ag and our, um, and our value-added producers are facing right now. Um, and it really is a moment for an all-hands-on-deck, uh, multiple-solutions approach uh, at all of us coming together um, and putting a lot of leverage to the existing programs and infrastructure that's in place for support and bringing in the private um, capital and resources that we can too, which is I think a place that land trust is, is well positioned to do something. So we're I'm gonna spend some time um, talking with you about that. Um, and I just wanna thank you actually for the uh, pandemic response bill that you've been crafting. And I want to come in, I mean, the primary reason I'm here is to testify in support of uh, that bill. I think this committee has done uh, uh, really good work in developing a proposal that is, uh, that hits, hits on all of the challenges that our ag community is facing. It's comprehensive and what it seeks to address. Um, I think the flexibility that is built into this, this program and approach um, the, the tools that it gives to our agency of agriculture um, and farm and markets, um, but also the flexibility um, that is in the bill around how those dollars get deployed is, is very good. And so we're, we're just really excited to see such a good bill coming together. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't take the moment to just say I, I wish that it was more. I think $30 million is a really good start. Um, I, I think 50 is probably you know, would be yeah. 40 for producers and, and 10 for processors, I think is, you know, is, is where we're gonna have to get to at one point or another um, in order to build a bridge uh, for our ag economy right now. 
Um, I also really appreciate the way in which it's, this bill is framed and that um, delivers that funding. Uh, it, 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 what I anticipate is it delivers that funding um, very, very rapidly and with a lot, without a lot of strings attached. And of course, it's oversight, uh, you know, making sure that this, the funds are spent well and giving guidance to the, to the agency around that. Um, and they'll, they'll do a great job with it. Um, but this is a time, I think, where we really need to be working to build a bridge for our whole ag economy. Um, and then, you know, with that bridge in place, we can then start to do the work that inevitably is going to come around transition, succession, diversifying the business models that are out there. All that work is underway. It's in front of us. Um, and this, this moment will, I think, uh, in the, the, the economic uncertainty and challenges we're facing from COVID uh, will certainly accelerate some of that. Um, and I think it, it's important on all, for all of us who work in this area of trying to support ag in Vermont to recognize that, that the transition is going to accelerate. Um, but, I, but I do think that this is a moment to build a bridge for everyone. And I'm excited that this bill is doing that. Um, I think the other, the other point that I will make is that um, time is really of the essence. Uh, yeah. this, this funding needs to get out the door um, and I, I'm not as steeped in that, that aspect of how we move from, you know, a bill to, uh, to a law and then to the actual allocation of that funding to the agency. But the timing of that really matters right now. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the, the, the crisis that the farm economy is facing isn't waiting for our funding. It's, it's going ahead full tilt. Um, in May, we had 14 farms uh, cease operations. Last May, we had one farm cease operations. And last May was when the dairy, like when, was when milk prices weren't looking so good. No. Uh, you know, so we're, we're really in a moment where we need to activate uh, the infrastructure that we have, the resources that we have, uh, and the, the partners. Um, and the state has built an incredible system through with VHCB, uh, with UVM extension. Uh, we're, we're happy to play our role in that. Um, NOFA, uh, Center for Ag Economy, Interville Center. I mean, it's our, the, the agricultural support system in Vermont is the envy of the country and it's here and it's ready to be able to be put into service. Um, but these funds need to, need to move and, and need to move very quickly uh, if we're going to um, be able to provide the support to producers that that they need right now, and I think this, and, and, you know, the committee is keenly aware of this because you live it and breathe it. But for every farm that goes out, there are you know a bunch of them that are just hanging on by the by the barest of threads, um, and and the consequences for for those folks of of this time is very real as well. Um, we were. You know, we've been working closely with, I think, I think about Dan Harrigan in Fairfield. Uh, this downturn has put a real crunch on his cash flow and every dairy operator across the state. He isn't transitioning out. He's not on the list of 14 that won't be operating anymore. Um, but he's really struggling um, to make this, work, this period work. Um, and anything that we can do to provide that relief and support um, is important for him, is important for Barney Hodges of Sunrise Orchards in Cornwall. Uh, Senator Hardy, I'm sure that you're familiar with Barney and his, his operation, but his apple shipments have slowed, struggling to hang on to land and the business that his father started 60 years ago. Um, again, you know, it's continuing to operate, but, but really challenged to do so in this time. Um, and that's true of literally hundreds of farmers uh, across the state. Um, Senator Pearson, I was, uh, appreciated your testimony around just recognizing that this is a moment where um, you know, the funding, the normal approach and the, um, the normal capacity isn't sufficient because of the scale of the challenge that we're facing. And I, so I think I, I really appreciate this bill as being um, an example of bold action. And I'd love to see it be, be even bolder and bigger or just, you know, more, more funding and more allocation to the good set of programs. I think that, that this bill envisions and has put into place. Um, you know, and then I think the last thing I'll say is just we're, we're your partner in this and the Vermont Land Trust is working very hard um, to organize and leverage the resources we can to help to 
um, alleviate the stress of this moment for the conserved farmers and, and landowners that we work with. Um, and yeah. that co and recovery fund that we uh, stood up last week is the result of long-term donors to VLT who have been with us and heard the stories and connected with the farmers that we've helped, the land that we've helped to protect and the farmers that we've worked with. Uh, they've come to us and they've said, you know, we know farmers are hurting right now. How can we work with you to support them? And, um, and, and started organizing with us around getting significant funding in place so that we could be a conduit for um, some of those relief funds and those support funds. As, as Ella was describing, I think so well, those little pieces of investment and transition to online and technical assistance um, that can make the difference uh, for farmers at this time. And we've had a, you know, the, the, the initial slug of funding that we got, which was about $75,000 from donors has already been allocated and spoken for in the course of three days. We have a long pipeline for we have a bead on about $200,000 of additional funding that's gonna come in from private um, donors and supporters of the organization. I think there's room to scale that and grow, but it, it underlines and emphasizes for me, I, I, I couldn't be strongly, more strongly in support of the idea of, of increasing by 150 or even just doubling um, the, the allocation to VHCB that you were talking about earlier for the Farm and Forest Viability Program. Um, we will match that um, with our efforts and, you know, the Center for Ag Economy and NOFA and other folks will do the same. And together, um, I think we'll build a really good bridge for our farm economy and we'll be able to protect this state treasure. Um, I think our farm economy and our farm communities and those people are, they're a treasure for our state and they, they need to be supported and protected uh, in this time. And um, I know that you all agree with me and I, so I'll wrap there. Um, I appreciate the chance to come in and, and testify with you. Um, and I'll take any questions you have. Yeah, well, thank you, Nick. And thanks for all your, your work and help. And, um, you know, it's a team effort. And it's great to have you guys on the team. Uh, not that you haven't been, but uh, it's really, uh, really uh, great. And, and that we can all work together for the same purpose and in the same goals. Uh, are there questions for Nick, uh, Brian? Thank you, Bobby. Not, not a question, but I just want Gus and Ella and Nick to know uh, the members of this committee also wish that the 30 was a 50. And in fact, maybe the 50 could be even more than that. But we have to sort of deal with reality at some point, too. And it looks like that's going to be it. Although part of the rationale for not having it be 50 now is that there could be some issue in the fall. I don't know whether the weather is going to affect this virus uh, to bring it back again or not. But I think it's sort of like keeping money in, in the bank, so to speak, so that we can uh, maybe step in again at some point and be able to help out again rather than just kind of like the fireworks, shooting them all off at once and then having nothing to fall back on. So we're very sympathetic with the funding, but we, we will face some constraints and uh, some other, as you are well aware, whenever there's funds, people tap you on the shoulder and say, could I have a little bit of that too? So that's, that's what we're working against. But you guys do great work and we appreciate, as our chair said, uh, you being a partner with us. Uh, other Questions for Nick or, or Gus or Ella? If not, um, I want to thank uh, the three of you for your time this morning. And if you think of anything, oh, Michael's waving. You want me to wave back or do you want to talk, Michael? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to ask Ella to to repeat the language change that you requested for the, you want it to be for food businesses uh, and, what, and what else? I would suggest either changing it depending on the committee's preference um, to farm and food businesses. Sometimes we use the word, instead of food business, sometimes we use the word ag related businesses to sort of focus more on those that provide services like slaughter and meat processing and, and distribution. Uh, so perhaps farm and ag related businesses. And then the other 
option I put on the table was just to use the language working lands businesses more broadly to to include some forest sector. We, we don't tend to see that be an overwhelming majority of the work, but uh, enabling a portion of our work to cover that. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, so are there any, uh, anything else, Michael, on your drafting part that you're gonna need or you're good? Well, it, it, it all depends on if the committee wants to add the other BHCB <laughs> language. Um, I yeah. sent it to Jen and Ella. I think Jen is having DHCB's attorney look it over. Um, and if the committee wants to include it, I will build it into the bill. Yeah. Well, anything else, folks, that you might, want? Might I take two more minutes? Is that, would that be okay if I took two more minutes? Um, well, I we'll take a vote on it. Um, no, go ahead, Nick. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, we're we're very excited, and I'll use the word relieved um, to see that as the budget is taking shape, there's an allocation for VHCB in it that is you know, that is appropriate. And I know that the first quarter budget, this preliminary budget that's being put in place. Is not the full story. It may get difficult in budgets to come. Um, VHCB is a critical infrastructure for this state. We can't function without them. Um, if we're the hands and the arms, they're the heart. And uh, so we work together to get this great work done. And I, I anticipate that there will be challenges to um, we'll all have to face in the in, in budgets to come, whether it's the quarters two, three, four budget that's coming or, or in days that, that, um, that follow. And I just really appreciate the commitment that we're hearing um, to conservation funding. And particularly, I think the recognition that conservation is, is a tool that can help us to get through this time if we use it wisely and in the right way. And we're very committed to doing that and working closely with the agency and others to make sure that we're uh, we're making the most out of the funding that's available. But I, I think conservation is a really important capital delivery for rural communities right now. And I'm um, glad to see that it is continuing. And I think, I believe, and I anticipate, the reason why I want to spend some time on it is I anticipate that support from this committee for that will be critical, um, has been critical, and will be critical in these uh, discussions to come. And, and Gus and I are working very closely together um, with, the, with the federal delegation to do what we can to potentially bridge that's available from, from federal sources, for, from ASAP, AL, and other things. So we're working hard on all aspects of this system together. And um, yeah, it's a really fundamental partnership. And the, the funding that's available from the state for VHCP is so essential right now. Yeah, well, we appreciate all that VHCB is doing, but also all that you guys have done in the past to, uh, you know, to shore up the ag community and in our farms and conserve. I mean, we are the envy of the country when it comes to our ag lands and how we protected them and, and have got the best farmers in the world uh, that run under such difficult situations and seem to still uh, be on top. So, you know, we know that doesn't happen alone, and and uh, you know, we're um, we're very um, appreciative of what what you all do to working together. And uh, so, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll we'll work and try to get our bill out. We want to try to get it out tomorrow or or no later than Monday or Tuesday so we can get it over to the house. And and I had long conversations with uh, Carolyn, uh, a chair of the house committee and and they're waiting for, for our bill. And I think they're gonna be great to work with it. Doesn't, we've tried to cover anything that any questions they've had We've tried to take care of it in this bill. So when it gets to them, it shouldn't drag on uh, very long. 
So with that, if there is a uh, Gus. No. Goodbye. No. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, I want you guys to get back to work. Uh, and uh, so thanks a lot for being with us. And uh, we'll, we'll do our best. We know you will. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you guys. Take care. Yeah. So um, uh, you want to get, we may as well talk about the, Michael's got the new language to add. And do you want to talk about the uh, extra money uh, at this point, uh, as long as it's fresh in our minds? Sure. Well, what do you think? Wait, what do you mean the extra money for VHCB or just in general? No, the, you know, they said that if they had 150 to 200 more thousand, but of course that's going to cut down on our other money that we want to ship out the door. Do you think we could put something in there that would give them a leg up with, um, with uh, commerce? No. You know, I certainly wouldn't mind giving them more money, but and when we talk about taking it out of the stuff that we're working on, it's it's a, it's a tough decision to make. Well, it it is because you know we're short on money to start with. So we were gonna, uh, Chris. Yeah, sorry, I had a phone call, so I probably missed parts of the conversation, but. Um, it's a pretty modest amount of money and it really answers um, some of the medium and longer term thing. I mean, think about it. I think about it this way. We're, we're, what does that get us to just over $300,000? So that's a 1% administration for the, the money we're trying to get out the door. We are going to have to answer just like, in the restaurant universe, the governor is under pressure to answer the question of, are we giving money to businesses that are closing? There's a similar dynamic in ag, and I think that this is the best answer we've got to that charge. And we also maybe are not going to be able to push forward the $500,000 for, for um, farm workers. So that this is just, a little piece of that. I don't know. The only question I have is because it is also part of their ongoing operation. Is there some of it that could be part of the first quarter budget? I know Jane wondered about that, Bobby, when I was talking to her. So I would guess she's shrewd enough to know that that was coming out of the 30, but it's worth asking that question. Well, I think, I think there's a good opportunity to to pick it up there uh, and and if that would give us an additional say 150 to work off from our 30 uh, I'd rather I'd rather get it out of the, the Q1 uh, budget or from uh, ACCD out of their what millions they've got for this uh, Ruth Did yeah I, was, I, I have a little spreadsheet going here trying to figure out the numbers I'm, it sound, I guess Brian probably does too and yep. others <laughs> um, so I've just been working on them and I just want to make sure there's to, that I have everything on the list um, the the dairy farmer slash milk producer dairy processors slash cheese makers, non-dairy farm operations, um, the farm worker retention program, although there's a pin in that obviously, um, and then VHCB technical assistance. Um, and this puts aside all the food things. I have a different list for the, the food security. Um, is there anything missing on that list that we've talked about that we, that in the farm ag, specific right did you have something 
Well, no, I just I did it a little bit differently, but but I think we can certainly work whatever parameters. I took the dairy as a separate one and the food bank and then Gus's crew and then the non-dairy farmer and processor. So I had four different pots of money, if you will. Um, and then I just worked the numbers back. Instead of being able to use 50, I used 30 and some were less, I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but the, the number had to be smaller than it would have been if it was 50. Yeah, I put the, the food bank thing in the, the, in the food security uh, column and was thinking it, you know, the ag relief package, if we're able to get 30 million for that. And if we can, I don't know if Bobby, if we have a number for the food security portion of it, but I was looking at 10 million because <laughs> there's just such a huge need for food security out there. And how do we divvy up that 10 million as a separate thing from the, the ad, but then putting ties into it, as Senator Polina mentioned yesterday, that would tie it to buying local food from farmers in Vermont. Uh, how did you add your numbers up that you plugged in? Yeah, so on the ag part of it, um, I, I guess I would ask Michael about whether it makes sense to, to draft the non-dairy portion of it as one huge packet, one big package, or if it's easier to do it separately for the dairy processors versus everybody else. Because I have it separated out, but if it, it seemed like it was complicated by how do we decide an amount if we added, if we put them all together in the same bucket. So I, I think that's probably your key decision point on, on keeping dairy with the other producers and processors um, because dairy does have that poundage tier system based on their milk handler license. Uh, and as the administration proposed it, the milk producer and the dairy processor were under one program. You could go back to that model, um, albeit with a specific appropriation for the processors versus the producers. Um, and then you could just have the other ag producers and processors separate and you could, you know, again, you're, you're going to run into that question. How do you set the amount? And you might just say, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a max grant award. You know, you're going to set a cap. Some of these producers and processors may have expenses or costs much greater than the cap, but you're doing what you can do. Yeah, the, I, that makes sense. But wouldn't they, if, if you were like um, uh, a big cheese maker uh, or yogurt maker, why wouldn't you go through ACCD to, uh, to acquire uh, some money? Well, that, that's uh, an interesting question because I was going to raise for you um, whether or not you add, wanted to add some default language at the end of the section about things like offset, that an award that they get isn't going to be offset against taxes or liabilities. But, and one of the other things that I wanted to raise is, do you want to say if, if they receive assistance for this economic harm from another program that they're ineligible to receive it under this program? Well, if we're, if we're going to try to help, really help, um, you know, the people that work the ground, as I call it, the dirt farmers, uh, you, you can't have a great big chunk of that going to the concrete and and in manufacturing places as long as there's money elsewhere that they could be um, taken taken from you know if there's dollars somewhere else uh, we ought to maximize our leverage and 
and get as much of that as possible uh, because that is manufacturing. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think we should at least have language like the, the anti double dipping language. Like you can't you can't cover your losses with both programs. One or the and other. And if they get rejected, say from ACCD, then they could apply through through our monies in uh, the agency of ag, but those commercial people, I mean, I would think they've got people on their staff that, that are certainly capable. Uh, they borrowed from Vita, you know, they have ties there, uh, that they have more opportunities uh, than, than our, our, farmers except for maybe the big ones are tied in like that but you talk with most of those big farmers and the the owners themselves are out and running the equipment and you know they aren't uh, uh, they aren't like the western farmers where the guy that owns the place or the investors that own the place are sitting in some plush office and they got all you know, a manager and all hired help. Our guys actually work work our farms. Yeah, I mean that's definitely true. Uh, especially the smaller operations, they have no very few staff members. They're out there doing everything yeah. themselves. <laughs> yeah, the wife does most of the finding, the all you know, the bookkeeping and all that, and and uh, yeah. So. Uh, Hi, Brian. The number you had yesterday, I just want to confirm, the 21793750 was that was just dairy farmers, correct? Well, it was the dairy and the goats and the sheep and it okay. was for the, for the farmers. Uh, okay. maybe even the the apple people and the, you know the I think they are all included in that small, small certified, medium, and large. Is that the way it is, Michael? They have to have animals, I think. Yeah. Well, three yeah. and up, I think it is. Right. So, is uh, could could Senator Calmer repeat that question? I'm sorry. Well, the chair yesterday, and I'm not sure how he did the math, but he had a real specific number. So I wrote it down, uh, $21,793,750. And my question was, was that earmarked just for dairy and just for the farmers? And it seems the way like- that, The way that it, that, that it, I believe it's set up and what that 21 million was gonna go to would be the milk. So, so yes, it's it's just for the dairy farmer, okay. not the dairy processor. Yeah, there was no money there for processing okay. or milk handling or any of that. Because and, that and none, of, none of the non-dairy farmers, none of the crop farmers or, or anything else, beef, poultry, that came in another pot of money, right? Okay. That's what right. I thought. It's, it's it's not just cow dairy; it's goat and sheep dairy, right. but, but it's it's dairy. It's yeah. dairy. Okay, thank you. What what happens if you have an arm on farm cheese plant or something? How have we have we, we haven't thought through that, as to my knowledge. I think no. I think the question came up the other day, but uh, yeah, the, we talked to uh, Evie about it. You can do both. They can qualify for both. The way the administration wrote theirs is that they would have they would have to separate out the two pieces of their business. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I specifically asked that, and I think we would want them to be able to do that, or I would at least, because their cheese processor on farm. It, I know it's come up elsewhere, and we may want to check in, like a hotel that also runs a restaurant. Are they getting twice the grant? I mean, I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it, but I should think we'd want to be consistent between the, it's the same dynamic. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why um, 
I don't know how many of those small processors there, you know, producers of milk and processors there are, but um, there's 271 small farms not certified. And I would expect that most of them would fall into that that category. You know, they're under under 50 that use their own milk to do their own uh, products. And I I would think we could work something for those those guys to be all in one. Wouldn't that be the simplest way to do it? Take so what do you mean by all in one though? Say that again. What do you mean by all in one? Well, they could show their losses from the milk they're producing. Right. But also they would have to show their losses of the cheese that they or the products they were manufacturing from those animals. Uh, right. and that would be their overall loss on their on their farm, wouldn't that? Yeah, I mean, they might not, if they sold the milk to the cheese company and got $30 a hundred weight for it to their own cheese, little cheese company, they could show a profit with their cows, but a loss on the cheese thing. And, and I would think that you would incorporate their their production and in their milk with the products that they manufacture from their own milk and that would be their overall loss on their on their operation yeah and i think i agree and i think some of them uh, i've been hearing from folks who um, are on farm cheese makers and it sounds like what they're saying is they lost their markets so i don't know whether they would look at their milk as one piece of their business and then no. the cheese making as another piece of their business. It's all one. Yeah, and they've lost awesome. their markets when the restaurants stopped buying cheese. They lost their markets, so they're really hurting from that respect. So they're looking to rebuild their markets, but they're also found themselves because of COVID having to hire more workers to like if they when they get back into manufacturing and have to keep social distancing and whatnot. They've actually talked about having to hire more people to help them dig out of the weeds that they're stuck in. So we would just say overall. It's it's your business numbers. I think so. Yeah, I think that would be the only way to. I mean, I'm sure they don't separate it out. Right. What about a diversified dairy? So they they've been making a ton of money. I'm just saying that probably not, but <laughs> on the vegetable. The the yeah, on show the us that one that's making a ton of money. <laughs> no, oh, hold on, there. hold on. So they, they, they have, you know, we heard from the, the guy who diversified into pumpkins. Well, he's not profiting on the pumpkins in June. But for instance, if there was a, a dairy farm that also was doing tomato starters and that part of the business was doing really well, would we, wouldn't we want that overall number to be reflected, not just their loss on the dairy side of the ledger. I mean, this is, well, maybe we just punt all of these kinds of questions to the agency, that's another option, but I'd rather have a little bit of some of the principles articulated if we can. I think if it's all part of the same business, then it would be included yeah. that way. You'd have losses in the milk, but you'd have gains in the tomatoes. So you'd look at the, you'd look at the bottom line after you combine those two things. I guess yeah, I ask Michael how we would draft this because I specifically asked this question of the agency and they were looking at them as separate. Um, and so if we want to not have them separate, then we would have to draft language to make sure that the agency doesn't default to looking at them separate because that's how they sort of have it in their mind, I think. Well, I think, I think if if you had a small dairy or a dairy uh, and you had a, a farm number and all that, and then you had, you also own the ABC Cheese Company uh, and it was incorporated or, or a co-op or whatever, 
you would have two companies. You would have your dairy operation and your ABC cheese company. But I, I believe that most of these small operators, uh, it's all, it's all connected. So the, the milk they produce goes in another room and, and they make their cheese and go to farmer markets and sell it. And, and that's what keeps uh, the overall operation running. And so it should be all, all figured out as one, I would think. So could you do something about an, uh, a business uh, a business name or a, a corporation or an S corp or something. If they're if they're running two operations, it'd be two businesses. But I, I mean, it seems like the numbers we're playing with, unfortunately, are are too small to cover all the losses. So. If you had a, a a small dairy farm that was also an on-farm cheese maker, and they got and their losses were, I don't know, twenty-seven thousand dollars, and twenty of it was from the milk portion, and seven of it was from the cheese portion, but their grant was only going to cover fifteen on the on the on the milk side. That wouldn't even cover their whole loss. Oh, no. So, so can they get it from both programs if it's not covering their whole loss? That I, I think it's the double dipping is only when it's above and beyond what their total loss was. Well, know. they, they only get the <laughs> under the program. They only get um, reimbursed for their for their losses or expenses. Right, um, but and you are, you already said that they don't get to uh, to qualify if if they receive a payment elsewhere. You can say that the small farm, or that's also a dairy processor, or, or any of the farms, only get to qualify uh, under both programs up until the the um, they're reimbursed for their losses and costs. Uh, Brian, so I, I want to ask a more basic question because I'm I'm getting more and more. I don't know if the word is frustrated, but I'm looking at the numbers and they're just not working very well. So we originally heard the governor's proposal as being 50 million, 40 for dairy and 10 for the processors. We've added, if you will, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do that. I think all of these considerations are important. The food security issue, which includes the Meals on Wheels and the schools and the food bank and Gus's uh, group, we've added that ourselves. So my question is, out of the $400 million proposal from the governor, were there other proposals made which could help those sectors and, and not have us dividing by six you know what I'm trying to say? In other words, it would give us, and I can't believe that the governor would have made a proposal or anybody would make a proposal and completely ignore food security. It just, I don't think there's got to be another pot somewhere that we don't know about. And I didn't read the whole proposal to be fair. I mean, 400 million is a lot of money to be spread about all kinds of different agencies. So I don't know where it is, if it's anywhere. Chris, uh, Chris did you talk to Jenny or... Uh, no, not, I don't have a direct answer, but um, the, the, I think as I've conceived it and, and we've talked about we because uh, remember yesterday we wondered about just jettisoning those sections like the, the Meals on Wheels and the food security yeah. issues. They're not they, they are close to agriculture, but they're not agriculture in the in the strictest sense of the economy. Yep. So I, I continue to believe we should not pay for that out of the 30 million. The other thing is to just, um, I think it's a helpful perspective as I understand it, because you mentioned the 400 million from the governor, 
the legislature has not used the 400 million number because the joint fiscal or the money chairs agreed to immediately set aside a chunk of that money given the shortfall in the ad fund and other things that and and to just not say no but say not right now we got to figure out if if there are other issues down the road or if we can use it to backfill the ad fund or whatever so we, we immediately agreed that we were not you playing with 400 million in the in the shorter term so both of those things trim back the budget options but in terms of the very direct question it's my assertion that we should spend 30 million on assistance to ag businesses and and uh continue to push our partners in the in the building uh for the food security uh priorities but have them pay for it. <laughs> so. No, I I think we've got to we've got to do that, or we aren't going to have enough money for to make a difference for anybody. Right. And uh, so I think I think that's where we are, uh, Ruth. Yeah, I I completely agree. I don't I I like I said when I was looking at thirty million for ag and then ten million for the food programs. And that would be separate, and that we would work with the other committees oh, um, to to come I didn't realize that. Together. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Okay. So, um, and uh, I I agree with Chris. And we get the Education Committee, Health and Welfare, and Economic Development, and approps all to be like, yeah, we need to do this. Let's find however much million. You know, right now I have it at ten, but it could be whatever. Um, so. I guess one thing I would like, because on my list continues to be the farm worker retention program, because you all know that that's important to me and I think to the committee. And but I'd like to hear Michael's recommendation as legal counsel definitively, so we can know if we should still try to do that or take it off the list, um, because it's still yeah. included in my numbers. But I guess Michael, I defer to you as our legal counsel. Yeah. Hey, Chris, I'm going to, I got to step away for a second. I'll okay. be right back. Okay. So, Michael. so uh, I um, informally uh, consulted with some of my colleagues about it, and the general consensus is that um, it's more of a workforce bonus rather than a hazard pay bonus. And the Treasury guidance is uh, pretty clear that it is um, workforce bonuses are across the board are prohibited. Um, only hazard pay where the employee is directly responding to mitigating the threats caused by COVID-19 are um, eligible. Um, and so uh, I think um, you can make an argument, as Senator Pearson did yesterday, that because certain people were out or employees were not working and some farm workers had to work more, that they w were working um, to mitigate the the. <laughs> threat caused by by COVID or the business interruption but but uh i and you could go forward with that and try to be persuasive if there was a single audit the treasury um but i think if you look at all of the the guidance it seems it seems more uh it seems less likely to qualify than something like the essentials workers bill that you passed or the um, school nutrition program. The essential worker, the people were in grocery stores, they were in restaurants, they were being exposed to the virus, they were working um, to, to you know, provide services. So, you know, I, I, I think that's a little bit more persuasive. Um, here, the, they were not directly exposed to the risk on a day-to-day -day basis in their operation. Um, 
their operation didn't necessarily need to impose significant safety measures. Um, I, I, they were probably working similar hours. Um, and I, I don't know if I, if you look at all those criteria, it looks more like a workforce bonus rather than a hazard pay bonus. I think but you can make, you, you can make arguments. And so it's really up to you if you want to make those arguments. I think that's going to be a hard sell, especially with the kicker that if if it gets rejected after we pay the money, that we got to come back and get the money out of the general fund to, to cover that that cost. I think it'd be rough. Um, Michael, can I just ask a follow up? Thank you for that. Um, and you know we're. We've heard from our, some of our colleagues and certainly from advocates about just making payments, straight payments to um, people who didn't qualify for the federal stimulus payments um, because of their immigration status. Um, and what is your opinion on the legality or the potential of that? Well, I would just take you back to if you're talking about straight payments from the CARES Act money, yeah, you you have to go back to the to the CARES Act criteria. Um, it wasn't previously budgeted, um, and it, it's a necessary expense. Um, and necessary expense has been defined as. Um, let me just pull up one of my documents. Um, that the, the expenditure incurred due to or as a result of the COVID-19 health emergency. Um, did the expenditure, was it incurred due to COVID-19? Um, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I again, you can make arguments. Um, but, uh, you know, this is one where I would. <laughs> You're Sorry, here. You on the spot. I'm just trying to get, you know, the, we, we worked a lot to try to get to something that was workable. And it, it sounds like it's just not going to, it's not going to be feasible and to, to provide payments based on the CARES Act wow. money. And we don't have general fund money to spend. You know what you could do, Ruth, maybe. <laughs> on the most of these guys work for the large or medium-sized firms. Put a little kicker in their grant that <laughs> certain amounts of it have to be used for their laborers. <laughs> but wouldn't that just be a workforce bonus that if we put language in like that, that would be a workforce bonus. And Michael has just said that that's not eligible right I, I I'll just read directly from the frequently asked questions document Treasury put out it says the guidance includes workforce bonuses as an example of ineligible expenses but provides that hazard pay would be eligible if otherwise determined to be a necessary expense is there a specific definition of hazard pay Hazard pay means additional pay for performing hazardous duty or work involving physical hardship in each case that is related to COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah, it isn't going to make it. Okay. Michael, you must have thought a lot about this because you knew we were pushing to try to get it done and you haven't, you haven't come up with any logical way that we could work the the words to cover it so i i thought it would qualify up until treasury issued this may 28th frequently asked questions document because i thought it was uh, uh assistance to a business that experienced business interruption and had costs that were incurred due to that um namely in, in paying labor force and, and keeping them on the farm. And you heard testimony about that from some farmers who had to let go of their labor because of, of rising expenses. I, I thought that would qualify, but then 
kind of treasury said no that that's a workforce bonus and they're only looking for hazard pay and i i I was with it. I, I was with you on it um, <laughs> up until this this document, which was issued last what Wednesday. Yeah. Well, um, so the food bank and the food issues will move to the right hand side of our page and and try to get the money out of out of um, ACCD or, or health and welfare uh, or any of those outfits. What, uh, Chris? Well, just, just quickly, I was just about to email uh, Baruth and Lyons and Kitchell and just ask them this question. But then I realized, Senator Hardy, you've been talking to Baruth. So is it okay to just include it all in one and then we just have it all on the table or, or would you rather keep handling the school meal issue separately? Um, you can, you can email all of them and I can just follow I'm up. I'm copying all of you. So you'll yeah. see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Chris, you, you might want to add Senator uh, Sorotkin too. Okay. Good you can yeah, yeah. yeah. So that puts us back to our basic ag bill and and we've got our we've got to deal with our small farms with cheese making that should be part of that small farms payment and and we're light i think we're light on the small farms payment uh, if we're going to add in their little manufacturing operations and the losses that they've been getting on their cheeses. And as, um, in that 21-7 number, uh, the small, small guys are only going to get $12,500 in that that's not going to cover much of a cheese loss or a loss there, uh, Ruth. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm curious to hear what Brian has, but um, if I, I took a shot at divvying up the funds and and just rounded up for VHCB to two hundred thousand since they asked yeah. for ninety two, just to make it easier, and then the cheese makers seventy five hundred. Non dairy farm operations, thirty three, a uh, seventy five, uh, seven thousand five hundred, or seven million five hundred, seven point five million. Sorry, <laughs> and then the non dairy operations, three point three million, and then the dairy farmers, nineteen million, and that gets us to thirty. Can you walk through those again slowly? Um, yeah. So the dairy producers slash farmers, milk producers, 19 million. 19? 19, one nine. Dairy processors slash cheese makers, 7.5 million. The non-dairy farm operations, 3.3 million. And then the VHCB technical assistance, 200,000. So that, that comes out to 30 million. And I don't have it broken down by the sub amounts for the, I, I think we would have to back in sub amounts, but I strongly recommend that we weight it toward the small processors and the small farmers. Um, the 7.5? Both the 7.5 and the 19 million, because we've heard a lot of testimony that the small end, that's where all the farms are going out or the small and medium ones, and that we, that, that, that they're struggling the most at the small end. So, you know, providing funding for everybody, but but having it weighted at the small end. That, but we, I haven't gotten to those details because I, I figured we should could back into those numbers. The uh, non-dairy, is that the uh, fruits and vegetables and, and turkeys and, and all that? Yeah, the, all of that plus the food, the you know slaughterhouses, 
uh, those kinds of, and meat processors and things like that. And, and all these numbers are fluid. I was just trying to come up with something based on the testimony we've heard uh, as to terms of the impact that each of these operations have been seeing. Um, uh, what did you have, Brian? Well, mine was different because I took into account the food bank numbers and all the rest of it. Um, so mine are useless now that we've pretty much, we're going to look for other sources for that food security part of this. So mine are old, old, old hat now. Uh, Ruth, the uh, the 7.5 yeah. processors, is that strictly dairy processors? Yeah, that would be the dairy pro processors, cheese makers. And we would, I think, after hearing- Ice cream, yogurt. Ice cream, yogurt, yep. And, and I, I think having the no double dip language or whatever it is that we just discussed makes a lot of sense. And, and just for the, the food security thing, which I have as separate, I had the summer meals for kids, 3 million, the food bank, 3 million, and meals on wheels, 3 million, just sort of, and then uh, if we can make the food service workers bonus, uh, hazard pay, whatever we're supposed to call it, work, that that would be in the, you know, 500,000 to a million dollar range, I think, but I don't have the real numbers. So just, I was just trying to fool around and it sort of does the senior, senior meals, kids meals, and then everybody else. And it chunks it out evenly. That's, was my thought. Well, if, if you wanted to use like the numbers that you just came up with, Ruth, if you took our original dairy numbers uh, from back when we first started, yeah, and, and with the uh, eight, I don't know, eight, eight point eight million by three, because uh, we were we were talking about doing three payments. If you did that to double. Take the original numbers, do two and a quarter times that. I think it would come out close to the 19. Do you have a calculator there, Michael? Or I got one. Pardon? I have one here. Yeah, on my so phone. I, I have one too. So if you took the original amount of I I think it was 8.8, .8, right? I don't remember. 8.7, well, 8. right. I think, is what our original amount was, but I don't remember. Yeah, 8.7, 17500 dollars If you took that and multiplied it by two and a quarter, <laughs> I think you're going to come out pretty close to that 19... That would give you nineteen million five hundred seventy-five. Yeah. So that that number that you came up with could work, and the system is all pretty much in place, except for we ought. I would think you guys would want to see that broken down uh, to the four different groups, uh, but you could take. Um, the way we've got it on, on this sheet, Michael, uh, you could take that that sheet that we you first sent out yeah. and multiply each one of them. There's only four. Uh, multiply them by 2.25 and and see how see how it comes out, but it should come out the same way except for, um, well, it's going to be a less amount than what, what I had on my 2.11 home. It'll probably be about a, a hundred, maybe 120,000 for the big guys. And you got them, Michael? I'm writing it down. There is there any way Michael has this on a spreadsheet that he could share as we 
Yeah, that would be the best way. Um, Bobby, can you take that document that you just put up to the screen and, and look at the number in the lower right-hand corner? It could say 348 something. Um, at 47, 9, 34, 79, mm -hmm. 50. If we pull this off, no one will ever believe we didn't even have a website. You know. <laughs> a website. <laughs> we'll pull it off. What do you mean if we pull it off? I haven't got a doubt in the world. <laughs> did did yeah. I give you the right number, Michael? Yeah, so uh, LFO would be $112,500. A MFO would be $50,625. 50? Yeah. A certified SFO would be $28,125. Again? $28,125. Because twelve thousand five hundred, yeah, times two point two five, yep, twenty eight one twenty five. This is going to come out to more than nineteen million, I think. But and then five thousand times two point two five equals eleven thousand two hundred and fifty. That's for the small. Mm hmm. And how many of them are there for each of these categories? Do you do you have that number, Michael? Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Oh shoot. Um, uh, I just screwed up something. Um, the there's I believe for LFOs there's thirty four. For MFOs there's uh, one hundred and five approximately. For certified SFOs, there's 268, and for the SFOs, there's 271. Those that, are the numbers. And that does not include any, uh, that there, there were the 14 farms that went out, and then there are the three that wouldn't qualify because they haven't. Right, and, 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 and this is all cows. This is not, this is not cheap oh, or goat this doesn't as include well. Those guys. Yeah, that, that number's a little bit high on the small end. Yeah, you know, I don't know if it's a 268 that would be deleted by 15 or or 18 and that or the 271. But I I would imagine that somebody not in good standings would be up in that upper category. And those are all payments that are multiplied by three, right? 2.25. 2 2.25, yeah. Well, I didn't do the math. I don't know what the grand total is. I'm trying to, I'm going to do that right now. It's, it, feel, it feels like it's going to be more than 19. I don't know. Why do we keep hinging on 19? Do we have 10 set aside for something else? I, yeah. The 19 was for the dairy and then for the milk farmers. <laughs> then the processors is 7.5 million, non-dairy operations 3.3, BHCB 200,000. That gets to the 30 million. We can change those numbers. I, that was just what I was kind of sketching out. Did you have any rationale for your numbers, Ruth? <laughs> I was trying to get to 30 million and yeah, it all in a way <laughs> that made somewhat sense. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I and also, based on the impact of what we heard in testimony, uh, also, yeah. you know, we did hear that there's in, an impact on the non dairy farms, but it's lower than the impact on the dairy farms, and yeah. there are fewer of them. So, 
And I've just been hearing from a zillion cheese processor, uh, cheese makers. So. So the, the little cheese makers are medium, small to medium cheese makers, is that? Yeah, the small and medium ones in my district. And I don't, I haven't tried to figure out how we're gonna, we're gonna let the ag agency figure that one out, how much to give each one of them. I think we should come up with our own numbers based on this, the little, the amounts, the, and I have it broken down micro, small, medium, and large. And I don't know what that is, but I, I you know, I, I don't want to give a ton to the huge processors. Like, do we need to be giving money to Ben and Jerry's when everybody's filling their shopping carts filled with Ben and Jerry's pints during this? <laughs> well, plus they, they can go to ACCD too, or, or B. Or, yeah. so what'd you come up with, Michael? Uh, 19.6. Right? 19. Did you multiply it by two, Michael? 2.25. Okay. And, if so, we, and that's, that's rough. Um, if, if we I run think it's going to... Go ahead. I, I think it's going to be a little bit higher than 19.6, but I think it's still going to be under 20. So I think, and if we run a little bit over, so be it, you know. Um, I hate to complicate things, but weren't we going to look at working lands too? Wasn't that something we were chewing on? Well, you don't need to chew on that any longer. <laughs> I should spit it out. Well, look at the house bill. What are they? They they're somewhere else. Yeah, they threw a big one in there for working lands. Yeah. Uh -huh. could, could you could you really fill fill this out for me? I, I'm not. I haven't looked at the house bill. I'd like they to. Added, they added a million bucks for working lands. Where? The appropriations bill. Okay. So they're in pretty good shape if if they can hang on to it. So Michael, I get seventeen point two million essentially. Maybe I did the math wrong, but so I came up with a hundred and twelve five hundred as the the LFO payment, and you, I multiplied that by thirty three. So I'd be yeah, but there's oh, that wait. number is. Right, I'm saying these are rough numbers. These are rough numbers. $112. 100, I'm 500, okay. 500. Okay, I, that, that was my bad. I missed a zero there. So now, oh, now I'm up to 20, 24.9 million. <laughs> right. Michael, so, are you so, doing this on Excel? No, I'm not. I am. I'm doing it on Excel. I think the 2.25 is too high. Pardon? I think the 2.25 multiplier is too high, Bobby. That that gets us up almost to 25 million. Well, I think we'll we'll have Michael work on those numbers. But well, 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 Nolan was listening. I don't know if he's still listening. Um, so we we could ask Nolan if you if you we set on what payment you want. Um, we can ask Nolan to, to run the numbers. Well, have him run them at 2 and 2.25. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Bobby. So I'll just point out in terms of Ruth's ratios here, the original proposal, which was the 50, 80% of that originally was going to go to the dairy farmers, which was the 40, and the other 20% was going to go to the processors. The way we've laid it out with the $30 million total, if we use Ruth's rough numbers, the processors make out a little bit better. They're getting 25% of that budget instead of 20, and the dairy is down instead of what would have been 24 million if it had followed the 80 million, they're now getting 63% with the 19. But 
We've also included, obviously, uh, the non-dairy farmers, which the governor's proposal didn't take into account, and then the mm -hmm. VAC. So I think all in all, I mean, we could push push them a little bit yeah. either way, but I, I think uh, overall it's it's pretty good. And I do favor, as, as I think all of us do, uh, taking a look at the uh, medium and small farms so that they're getting a little bit bigger piece of the pie. We well, may have to that. The way, the way I figured it out, um, they were, they were getting the, in production, the two big, medium and large do 85% of the milk and the two small. Pardon? Anthony, you're not muted. I didn't know if you were trying to talk to us or not. No, not you. No, it's fine. The production levels of, of the groups are, you know, it's almost in reverse of the way the money's going out, but not quite a, an even match. Yeah. So, uh, did... Do you know if Nolan was on, uh, Michael? Um, I can I can reach out to Nolan and have him help us with these numbers. But so I, I I'm sorry I Nolan isn't on says Linda I, I I should have written it down the first moment you guys started playing with numbers. I'm watching the old spread, the old table here that gets to 8.7. I, right. I understand you've multiplied that by some number, two or two and a quarter, but um, I, I'm, it's hard for me to do without seeing something. So, so we also want to deal with processors and where does the non-dairy farmer fit in all of this? 3.3 million. 3.3. Yeah. That's yeah. for the vegetable and fruits and meat and hemp and every yeah. You know. So that doesn't include that doesn't include um, small dairy processors. No, no. small dairy like the cheese, produ cheese producers, I mean those folks. They're right. no. So, so I, I wish we could some have Michael or somebody share this on the screen as we're manipulating it live because it seems like the structure is well set up for that. But, but we we're we're dealing with all milk producers producers. Then we're dealing with milk uh, all milk farmers. Then we're dealing with some pro milk producers. Then we're dealing with non dairy farmers. And then we're got a tiny sliver for VHCB. Is that the entirety of our thing? Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's like the second thing you mentioned, you said small dairy producers twice. Uh, you meant processors, I think, when you said that. Well, yeah, yeah. So producers and processors. Most of the money goes to dairy farmers. Right. Yeah. Not just cow dairy, but but by and large. Cow dairy. Right. Then then some chunk of it goes to processors. Right. Some chunk goes to non-dairy farmers. Right. Yep. Two two thirds, one third. Two thirds to dairy, and and one third to processors, non-dairy, uh, VHCB. That's the way. Basically, I've got it down. And. And like Brian said, the old way was 80%. Was it, Brian, 80 went to dairy? 80 went to dairy and 20% went to the processes. Yeah. And so, you know, we're, we're in the ball game, you know, uh, in, in, in the area of, I think, accuracy. What what is the ratio? If if yesterday, who was it? Somebody said that that dairy makes up seventy percent of our ag 
economic activity. Is that right? Did we hear that from somebody? Yeah, E.B. Flory, I think. Yeah, that number struck me as actually lower than I would have assumed. And well, it was 80 at one point. Yeah, I yeah, thought she said 80. Yeah, I think she said 80. And and that would include both the processors and the and the farmers. So we're in that ballpark, right, Brian? Did you? Well, actually, I didn't add up the process, but if you do that, yeah, we're probably close to that. Yeah. So, so she says here, I'm looking at her testimony, dairy counts for 70% of Vermont's agricultural sales. Um, See, maple bumped up a lot, so. So I, it just seems to me like we ought to roughly, I mean, we're trying to balance this and be fair, and we ought yeah. to use we ought to use the lay the land to reflect at least how we're thinking about it, unless we have heard that one sector is particularly harmed. It seems well, like we ought to give dairy seventy percent. We're at we're at sixty six and two thirds. You know, we are not if you add the processors. Pardon. What about when you add the processors? There's another 7.5. So now we're giving 27 out of 30. That's more than two thirds. That's with the processors and the dairy guys. I, I guess mean, that's my point. We're high on the processors. That, guys, that is kind of my point. I don't know the right answer, but I maybe maybe we give to the diversified the non dairy so the meat and the veggie guys. Maybe we could take a little bit out of the processor and go there. But Chris, if you want to give the farmer the dairy farmer seventy percent, they should be getting twenty one million. No, I I think EB's thing says dairy overall, which. Uh, I'm trying to read here. Dairy farms over 80% of Vermont's farmland. You guys, I just sent you a link to the Google Doc that I have up that I'm working on these numbers. I sent it to you too, Nolan. I see that you're on, and Michael. Um, so you can sort of see how I've done the numbers. And the dairy, to get anywhere close to the, the, um, 19 million is one the multiplier is 1.7 basically not 2.5 or yeah what if we brought the processors down to five and added and brought the non-dairy up to five see the only problem, Chris, is we got to kind of remember that maple has moved into a lot higher category because they're producing a lot more. And I don't know if they've had any loss of sales or, or you know, that's diluted the overall picture, I think. My, Michael. The, 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 the chair makes an excellent point, um, but isn't, isn't the language protective in that you have to demonstrate a loss or an expense? So, so maybe, maybe we might be smart to set it up so that, you know, come October 1st, there's a waterfall or something like, I, I guess I'm just, oh. I, I'm not, I'm not articulating this well, but Maybe you're right, Mr. Chair, absolutely. And maybe we're wrong about a lot of the presumptions going in here, but, um, but we do have this protection of, yeah. they have to demonstrate a loss or, or an expense, correct, Michael? That, that's correct. And in the processor language, they can't have had a net profit over, over that period, which you had set to August 1st yesterday can't have a net profit between March and August 1st. Um, yep. Where are the goat and sheep farmers in this? I'm trying to 
<laughs> they're in the milk. The, they would be in the milk producer language. Okay. They would, I'm just trying to account for everybody I can think of out there. <laughs> so, Chris, I, 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 I hear you, and I am completely sympathetic to your trying to get the percentages to based on what EB's testimony was the 70 percent and um I, I think we could sort of mess with the numbers a little bit but i do want to say that you know one of the reasons i i divvied it up this way is based on the testimony we heard and based on the farmers i'm hearing from and the um the impact on cheesemakers has been pretty substantial especially high-end value-added cheesemakers who sell to restaurants and um, you know, those really fancy cheese shops in New York City um, that are just not operating right now. So I, I think that um, that's why I, I weighted the dairy processors, the, the, the cheese makers higher because of the impact that, it's, that we've, the COVID has had on them. Sure. Jane Kitchell told me Jasper Hill's hiring today. Oh, so the, 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 the problem is, I agree with that, Senator Hardy, it makes you know, the, the problem is the, the, we just don't really know because we're always operating under the people that contact us and tell us the horror stories. And meanwhile, I'm willing to bet a lot of the little farmers are scrambling and have not given much thought to the Senate Agricultural Committee. And, and I, I just don't know I mean, that's where I, 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 I would be more comfortable saying, well, we've hinged this to the lay of the land of the division of, of the agricultural economy in Vermont, not we've hinged it to the people that we've heard from a lot, because I, I, I just, you know, I, I'll go, I'm happy to work together on this. Obviously, we're doing it. And seeing your spreadsheet, by the way, is a big help. Thank you. Um, but um Who's got the spreadsheet? Ruth sent around a link. I sent around a link and I'm still working on it, trying to get it to make more sense. Um, but it's a I also think that going back to what Chris was saying at the point of even out the money, I think that a lot of the non-dairy farm operations, the vegetable growers and whatnot, are not gonna necessarily be looking for large amounts of money. I think you'll find that with some of those folks, a relatively small amount of money is going to go a long way, setting up a farm stand or a website or something along those lines. So I think that the more expensive things are going to happen in the processing more than in the non-farm, non-dairy farm operations. So do you think that's three? I think the 3.3 might be reasonable. I'm not totally convinced yet, but I just think that the amount of money they're going to be requesting as individuals is not going to be that much from, for individual farmers. And it's, I think it's the traditional dairy farmers that are hurting probably the most because they've had four or five years of a bad run with low milk prices. And, and you know, there's been a lot of money made in the milk business that hasn't ended up back on the farm because of the low milk prices. Uh, Rose. Hey, Michael or Bobby, could you just give me those numbers for the small, medium, large again? Yeah, this, this, your small, up. your small farm number looks way high. Yeah, I, I copied something and it messed it up, so I'm trying to get back to it. So the large farm was thirty-three. Uh, thirty-three. And not, not the number, the 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 amount. Oh, no, the the large farm was one hundred and twelve five. Okay, and then the medium. Um, five oh six two five. Right. Five oh six two five. Fifty six. <laughs> Wait, say five, that again. Fifty thousand six hundred twenty-five dollars. Okay, thank you. But well, your your numbers aren't. Yeah, yeah, I'm fixing them, Chris. I got them. I got them wrong. The certified small. What is that? Twenty-eight one two five. 28125. And then the small farms. 11250. 11250. Okay, I will do it again. And Nolan, I'll give you I'll give you editing access to my spreadsheet so you can fix things you see. Okay. 
<laughs> Solve. Um, so, uh, Chris, I, I, um, I, I, I mean, I think if if we're worried about cheese makers, which we are, because they've lost markets in New York City and restaurants, then we have to acknowledge that a whole lot of our veggie producers and meat producers were pushing their product into restaurants. And I, I, I just think they're, they're not as used to coming to the legislature. They don't have associations in the same sense. And I, I'm really uncomfortable. Um, I mean, we're making a lot of presumptions and the, one of them seems to be that we're, that they're doing okay. And I, I just, I don't think we've heard that. And I, I'm not sure how we can as, assume it's true across the board in cheesemakers and assume it's not really been very painful for everybody else. And I don't know the right number, but I, 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 this makes me uncomfortable. Although, Ruth, your numbers are going to drop after you update all that, right? Yeah, I'm going to update it all and change it. And Nolan or Michael, the, the numbers on the side... The 34, 105, 268, is that accurate? That's what we're working with? Uh, that's that's pretty accurate. It's going to be a little bit more than that when you add in the, the, the goat and the sheep. Um, but it, it'll, be, it'll be around those numbers. Apologies, I'm so late to the game. Are you guys backing into a specific number intentionally or? 30 million. 30 million is your number? For, for both, for the future security and the ag or? No. It's not the food security. Uh, no, food security is not part of this. Okay, got it. All right. Yeah, this is. Ah. I know that Ruth was a. Uh, JFO equivalent in a former life, so I trust her spreadsheet skills. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Don't give me props yet. <laughs> Thank you. The old adage, uh, trust but verify, Nolan. Yeah. Let's, yeah, <laughs> happy to. Yeah. Um, so, uh, are there... <laughs> Are there other issues in the language that that we're dealing with that um, need to be, while Nolan's working on these numbers, uh, that we need to fix Gus's language, right? Yeah. Michael? Yes, yes, yes. And, and uh, there's two versions of Gus. There's two now um, proposals from VHCB. There's the um, the technical assistance for viability for farmers post COVID. And then the language about changing their authority um, and repealing the sunset on the rural economic development initiative. Uh, do you want that added to this bill? I thought we were going to add that okay. uh, to the bill. The extra money we were going to try to pick him pick up for him would come from uh, the uh, Q1 budget. Okay. Yep. All right. So leave the 192. Yeah. Um, okay. We could uh, round that to 200 just for round numbers. What, uh, whatever you would like. Well, uh, it's got to add up to 30 million. So we'll, we'll see how we come out at the, with the 192. Okay. Um, the, the next thing I want to put on, on I, your radar is. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think I just blanked out there. I was watching the spreadsheet. <clears throat> Are we adding this grant eligibility language that VHCB was, did you just decide that? That, that's what I, I took that yeah. conversation to mean. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and it also includes repealing the sunset on the ready program. Okay, I don't know what that is, but okay. The yeah. Rural Economic Development Initiative Program. Senator Pelina's idea from a few years ago. 
That's when was it going to sunset, Michael? That was uh, going to sunset. Next year, next year. Okay. Yeah, I'm and fine that, with it. That's, that's a hellish deal we made. We put 75000 Oh, it's that one. Yeah, yeah. And it gained like $3 million it generated in, in two maybe, years. Maybe we should double the budget. Well, <laughs> I, I've got a, an issue going in a props to increase the ready money so that we could have two people doing these grants. And it's, it doesn't help uh, like Burlington very much, but it helps all rural communities around the whole state pick up new money. Burlington uh, is happy to support small towns throughout the state. No, I, and I, Burlington has helped us a great deal and and those of us that realize that from rural areas appreciate all that that you do. <laughs> so, so another issue I want to put on your radar is public records. So people will be supplying information to public agencies, um, including things like their production numbers, their, their um, sales, etc. Do you want those to be public um, or do you want them not to be public? Well, things like things like that, I don't think the farmers will give a hoot about that, but it's still not right. But I can see cheese manufacturers that may apply that have to put in the pounds that they manufacture or make. I don't, boy, that's pretty, um, you know, I don't think that's very important that everybody in the world can look at those numbers. Michael, could, could we do it in, in a way that just made it clear it was an auditable thing, but not otherwise public? <laughs> Sure. I, I was thinking that the, the name of the person and the amount of their award would be public, but the information that they provided to show economic harm would be um, not public and subject to audit. Yeah. But would think... that trigger an automatic exemption from the public record? Because Anthony and I are very sensitive, and Chris was a member of the Government Operations Committee, too, at one time. And every single time we start talking about that, we've got tremendous pressure. Well, take yeah, the, heat. the the that's what, the, that's what the you way that the I box for. So I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. <laughs> as the guy that actually put together that list of Public Records Act exemptions, I I am I am empathetic to your to your position. What that's I would would say you could do is you could say that the information that they provided to show economic harm uh, is confidential business information that's <laughs> exempt under 317C9, which is the existing trade secrets and confidential. You wouldn't be creating a new exemption. You would just be saying that the information qualified for an existing exemption. Okay. Uh, it'd be better best to do it that way. Otherwise, the bill may end up in government operations committee. You don't want to have that happen. No, you guys would ruin it in there. <laughs> Michael, do you have the numbers for the number of cheese processors? And I don't. I don't have that. Um, no, I don't. Okay. Well, we had it at some point. Maybe it's in the testimony from the ag agency, but that would be helpful for Nolan to come up with the amounts for the different levels for the cheese process. Somebody said, I think it was EB, uh, 54, 54 something, 54 processors yesterday or something. Yeah, I, I seem to remember that when they, when we had Steve and uh, the eight and Anson and those guys in to testify, they gave us numbers on the different levels. Somebody did. Um, I just couldn't find it, but that then, cause we need to do the same thing with dairy processors to try to figure out. Cause I backed into $19.2 million on the, um, on the dairy farmer part of it 
Um, and I can keep working on those numbers, but you can sort of see on the spreadsheet where I'm at at this point. Can, I can back it down even more, but. Um, uh, I don't want to back it down more. If anything, you keep that number up around the 20 number. You know, 19 and a half to 20 million. I've got it to 19.2, Bobby. And and if we take if we back that up, if we don't back that down, then we have to take it out of somebody else. So sticking with the sort of percentages that we talked about, um, the 19 million is where, but anyway. Mr. Chair, were we gonna take a break around 10.30? Um, yeah, I think we're late. So I think so we'll too. Take, take five minutes and then we'll come back. Um, we're back live, I would presume, Linda. Yes. Yeah. That's what we never so, left. Never left. Um, so, um, Nolan, have you gained numbers yet? Yes, I can read that, whoever's typing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Ruth just gave me access, so that was my test. So Ruth's been doing the work, so Senator, Senator Hardy's been doing the work so far. So how, how do we, uh, look, I, I don't, I'm not quite ready to let it go, but I could be convinced to let it go. But EB Bye. comes in, she testifies that dairy is 70% of the ag economy and we're giving them 88% of this money, as far, as far as I can see. Uh, how did you get to your 88%? Uh, 26.5 out of 30. And you're counting in the processor money as well as the dairy farm money? Is the, dairy, is the processor money going to processors other than people that work with milk? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think that included like Cabot cheese and, and those guys in the 70%. You know, I think she was talking about the milk, the milk guys. All right, hold on. I'm going to, you can find her, um, her testimony here i'll share it with you look at this because i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bank on losing seven six or seven million dollars of dairy money to processors and when they can go to uh, accd and get get money so it's her testimony says which I just sent you, um, says in Vermont, our dairy farms make up over 80% of Vermont's farmland and contribute 3 million in cash circulation each day. Dairy accounts for 70% of Vermont's agricultural sales with over 1.3 billion in dairy products and byproducts sales each year. Of this 1.3 billion annual sales, artisan cheesemakers account for the largest amount for one product category at over 6 150 million, so over half. This number exceeds the direct sales value of fluid milk by over 50%. Overall, dairy generates 2.2 billion in economic activity. So that's the multiplier. But she she seems to say the 70% in dairy products and byproducts. I, w I don't know. I mean, Michael Nolan, is that, wouldn't that be the processors yes that would that would be processors as well so i i mean i want dairy should get their share clearly uh, i thought we included slaughterhouses and other processors in that processor number there we, we did have up to this point so that isn't point. just dairy chris okay i i, I the way it is right, right, now, right. The way it is laid out is that it is just dairy processors. In the if, language or the spreadsheet? In the spreadsheet. Spreadsheet. In the language, Michael has it all combined in the language. And so the question I had was, is it easier to have it all combined? 
from a drafting and budgeting perspective? Or is it easier to separate them out? And if we do separate them out, I think it's a fair question to say, what, how much do we give to the dairy processors, the cheese makers, and how much do we give to, to non-dairy farmers and processors? And the, the reason that splitting them out may be easier is because of the, the different levels of poundage of milk processed, which is not relevant to maple and veggie and apple and stuff. And I just got the numbers from the agency of processors by tier. I will email that to all of you. Um, so, does the processors, by tier, when you look at the processors, the way the administration laid it out, it, it was assuming that all the processors were going to get a payment similar to the way dairy farmers are going to get a payment. That's the way I kind of read it. And I don't think we should necessarily be presuming that all the dairy processes are going to need payments out of this fund. I mean, Commonwealth Dairy down in Brattleboro, it's owned by the largest dairy producer in the world. So I think it's a French company. Do we're going to give them money? I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't I don't think they'd be eligible to apply. Under the governor's scenario, I think they would be. Yes, I, you're right, Anthony. Under the governor's scenario, they would be eligible because they'd be in that largest category. And we can make ours different so we don't even include that largest category. But why wouldn't we just, I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Why, I can understand why we're giving farmers a payment based on their size or the number of cows. That There's somewhat some sense in that. But to just say the processors, <laughs> you're going to get a check because we're presuming you lost money. Doesn't really doesn't really make sense to me. Well, we can't justify that either unless they've lost money, and therefore it wouldn't be eligible to to uh, you know they wouldn't be eligible to draw money unless they could show and prove a loss or right. in trouble. Yeah, there's the whole language about economic harm. It's just right. a matter of setting the tiers if we want to do that. Maybe we don't even want to do that. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out what is easiest for budgeting and drafting. And so, Michael, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. but um, I think if you want to separate dairy out it's, and you want to do it by tiers, it's easy, it will be easier to draft that than to try to include dairy with the other ag processors. Um, and frankly, I would probably go back to the administration proposal of having the milk producers and the dairy processors under one program, but a separate appropriation to each of them. Um, and then for the ag, the other ag processors, the non-dairy ag processors, um, you would, I think the only thing you would need to do there is set a maximum cap award you're not going to be able to tier all of them so you're going to have to make a policy decision about how you want to cap the, the amount um, well, that they can receive if we put the cap we have the number right of processors yeah you have the there's 110 total 52 or under 500 38 or 500 to 10,000 pounds a day um, nine or 10,000 to 50,000 a day, three or 50 to 100,000 a day, four or 100,000 to 500,000 a day, and four over 500,000 a day. Well, <clears throat> so how many categories are there, Michael? Six. Six, okay. Um, so, I mean, if you cat, <clears throat> if you cat, cap that we've got we've got seven how much seven million for them how much 7. do you 5. have for the 7.5 yeah 7.5 but that can be changed this was just a i can move all the numbers <laughs> and i can do it before your eyes chris you so can watch I, them i've them. been transfixed i can't <laughs> Well, Anthony, what do you want to do for a cap? Or Brian, what do you guys think? Uh, if if you've you got... Yeah. If I think it could be relatively small. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, a cap, I don't know if this seems small, but when I, the first number that comes to mind, it's something like twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars. Well, if you multiply twenty-five thousand uh, by the total number, how do you come out? That's a question for Ruth or Nolan. I'm working What's the on number that. to multiply by? To, uh, the total number. It'd be 2.75 million if you just multiply 110 by 25,000. But you don't want to do that, I don't think. I was trying to come up with a way to tier it. I don't know how you'd want to do that, though. To tier That's what? That's the problem. Like, you know, but you each, depending on the amount of pounds per day, the grant. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm working on now. I just put it in there. You see that, Chris? Uh, I'm on a different sheet. Yeah. <laughs> Chris? But so putting no. in a number of pounds per day is, is assuming that it's all based on their volume as opposed to their need. But, right. but they still have but, to show economic harm, Anthony. Right. They can't get the amount unless they show that they've lost that money. Right. So if we have a cheese yeah. processor who, you know, went to have an on-farm cheese stand and they've been selling it like hotcakes or cheesecake, then we're not going to give them money because they're doing fine. Right. Right. You know, you don't. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily um, have a specific um, cap per per size, you can just say, here's the amount of money in the fund. And then they apply based on their need, they have to justify their need. And then the agency has the discretion to decide, you know, up to a cap, how much is you know, relevant, the bigger ones will have bigger, the smaller ones will have smaller. And then until the money runs out. But yeah, that makes sense to me. We, don't, we don't have to be as we don't have to micromanage it, we can give the, some basic guidelines to the agency and say, Go forth under these principles until the money runs out. Yeah, but the you're leaving the agency to settle on a cap. So someone well, we can set the cap. I just soon set the cap if if the committee wants to do that and and then that, let them deal with it. I agree. So what's the good number? Twenty five? Well, I think 25 would cover a lot of the small guys up to their, you know, right up to their limit. And it would keep the money from all disappearing to a certain sector uh, that can get their application in quicker and, and all of that. And I, I think on the mm -hmm. upper crew, uh, the larger ones, maybe we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't have the language in there that would tie them up where they couldn't apply to other sources because their losses, I mean, like Cabot, it could run up pretty high, and we wouldn't want to just give them twenty five grand and keep them from applying to get another amount of money from a CCD, I wouldn't think. True. Do you, do you want to set the cap at the, at the percentage that basically use the agency's proposed caps for those different categories and then multiply, reduce it by what it was reduced by because you went from 10 million to 7.5? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Just give me the numbers and I'll plug them in right here, Michael. So, so under five was 56,500 as a cap from 500 to 9,999 was 70,000 as a cap from 10,000 to 49,99 was 97,000 as a cap for um, 50 to 999. It was 127,000. For 100 to 499, it was 157,000. And for more than 500, it was 185,000. Okay, so I can just, I can back into the 7,500 if right. that's what we're going to want. What is, are, are you okay with the 7,500, Chris, or should that be lower? Well, 7.5 7 million. million. I'm sorry, I keep saying it wrong. 7.5 million. Well, they're all just I, pennies. 
They're all pennies, right, Bobby? How many pennies? So many they're pennies. They're not pennies, they're dimes. Dollars and a half. So I, I, I'm, look, I, I, I'm going to stick to this principle that it should roughly come out to 70%. And the, all, of, all of the addition, it's that big metropolitan area in Montpelier with the fire trucks. Um, all of the up under 500 per day and all that, that's all dairy, right? That's all just cheese, correct? Yeah. Yes. I numbers a little. Chris, what do you think? I, I, I'm liking, well, I mean, <laughs> so you, you, you're giving dairy 86% here by def definition. And so that, uh, uh, you know, that's 16%. I mean the numbers. I just want to hear what the committee wants to do. I can make the numbers do anything you want. It's awesome. <laughs> I mean, we'll make I them be in line with what Chris is saying and see how it works. Okay. Let's see. So that would have to, okay. That would mean adjusting the overall amounts for both milk producers and, and the dairy right. process. Yep, that's what I'm doing. We'll see, and then I can back into it. And, you know, you could also have, if, if the chair's right, that there haven't been the losses outside of dairy, then we could have a October, September 15th process where it reverts to dairy. I, I don't know. I'm willing to think about that. I just, um, the, the, the other, so the spreadsheet and the language are, are at odds, but, yeah. um, but it's helpful. We're, we're sort of having a dairy section of the spreadsheet and everybody else. Right. Right. That's that's what it would wind up as, yes. The uh, but we know we know very firsthand that the the milk producers have been the big losers. I mean, we haven't we haven't had a ton of other witnesses come in uh, to testify, and we've had how many meetings we've been going on for three or four weeks uh, with meetings. And, and we know that the small cheese guys are having a hard time because we did get testimony on that. But we haven't heard one word from Commonwealth. We haven't heard, I don't think anything from Ben and Jerry's. And I don't think we've heard anything from uh, Cabot, uh, cheese making from Cabot farmers. Uh, but we do know that the people that supplying them with product is they're losing their butts. And, and uh, so that, that's where the money should be going is where the most problem is. And, and I think we're, we're running pretty good at this point doing that. Uh, and helping the other farmers along the way with some help. So the way I just moved the numbers, it would be 75% for dairy farmers plus processors and 25% for non-dairy farmers plus VHCB. And that would be 17 million, 55, 5.5 million, 7.3 million, and then 200,000. So, and I can back into the, the sub amounts if I don't want to start changing those until we have the bigger amounts. Okay. Well, personally, I think the 17 is light. I do too. Must be the cheese guys or, or the processors are high. I, I, I like, if I were going to wait it, I'd give more to the pros to the cheese makers, but, um, but uh, I don't know. So maybe that makes it. <laughs> then well, the farmers? It's basically 56, 57% for the dairy farmers, 18 for the processors, and 24 for the non dairy. Yeah. So, I like you know, your original numbers better, Ruth. I think 
I think the numbers are, are messed up somehow because you shouldn't give 25% to the processors. If you, if you think of the process numbers, it was 650 million that they generate. I think it was 18, 18 million for this process for the dairy processors. Yeah, that's 18%. That's, sorry, 18%, not 24. No, but I mean, Chris's number, he, you're talking, Bobby, are you talking about the, the testimony we got the other day from EB? EB. Yes. What did you say, Chris, again? 650 million were, was what was uh, attributed to cheese. Yeah. And we're giving them out of out of one point three billion, so that's about half. Right, that's a lot. Half of what happens. So actually, it's two point two. Million, Sixty-three million out of one point three billion. Chris, her her thing was six hundred fifty million overall dairy generates two point two billion in economic activity. That's what her testimony said. Yeah, dairy does three million a day you know it's it's billions of dollars that come into the state uh from dairy and it's 70 percent of the ag economy is what she's saying I, you know. of the, and this would give 75 percent of our package to dairy a shameful addition no i'm kidding it's it makes sense dairy i mean look dairy's hurting we understand that i i think it needs to be you've heard my arguments you've given a little bit towards the 70% it's still at 75% so uh, now the question seems to me is the ratio between to farmer to versus producer the right one or processor the right one and I, I that I'm I have less strong feelings about I, I I tend to agree that it should be more to farmers would be my gut but I don't know well, I know if you play with the numbers on the milk produ producers, 17 isn't enough to make a, a big enough difference. You, you've got to get up closer to 19 to 20 million to, to make that really meaningful and helpful or we're going to be too light on that. And they're the ones that are bleeding the most. I agree. Well, I think that the cheese producers are too, but, um, and some of them are also farmers. I mean, that's the thing. There are people, a lot of these people are both, but. Well, but they'll get it, so they'll get the money, want, they'll, they'll be better off getting the money as the farm side, right? Well, I would think so, because you've got to feed the animals to be able to keep them healthy and well to make the cheese. All right, so I just moved it to 18 and 4.5. That gives 60, that's still, that's 75 still. That's 60% to the farmers, 15% to the cheese makers. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure I care so much. I just, I can just back into any of the numbers or Nolan can. I, since yeah. I I'm making, I'm not letting you, I'm, I'm letting you drive right now because you can't have too many drivers in the driver's seat, so. Um, but I think it seems like you want to figure out what your percentages you should be, and then we can back into it. See, the other, the other way we could do this is have it set up so the smaller cheese makers that we've got quite a few of, we know they're producing their own milk to make their own cheese. We, we could allow them to apply for both, both ends of it if they so chose um, and and it would give the little guy two bites at the apple which might help them more than than having it all under um, one or the other would that be difficult to do michael so i i don't think so um, going back to a point you made earlier, so if they, if the, the producer, if the farm has a corporate entity that's a producer and a corporate entity that's a processor, they're going to have 
separate economic harms, right? And so they should be able to apply for as a producer and as a processor, correct? Yes. Uh, but if they don't have a separate corporate entity, you want them to be able to apply as a producer, uh, basically under to qualify under both programs, provided that they don't double dip, that they only right. they only get their um, actual losses or expenses. Well, if they added, if they're running out of their checkbook, let's say you know everything goes into one account, everything out of that account their their losses are going to be i would think greater if they're a farmer producer of product than just a farmer right so i, I think what i just explained you were you right into it that says a uh, um uh a uh, farm that operates both as a milk producer and a dairy processor with separate corporate entities for each may apply under each program. A farm that operates as both a producer and a processor but doesn't have separate corporate entities um, may apply under both programs provided that they um, cannot receive um, payment for more than their economic, their overall total economic harm. Yeah. And that would push more money to those small cheesemakers, yeah. which are hurting the most. Yeah. I'm fine with that. I like that. That sounds good. I'm, I'm still messing with the numbers, but overall, do you want me to go back up to the 19 million? I would very much like that. So then we would take it out of the cheese makers or would we take it out of the non-dairy? Because it's got to come out of one of the other ones. I'd take it out of the non-dairy because guys like Paul said he might use what, twenty or thirty thousand to revamp his operation to deal with the turkeys and and uh, fruits and vegetables. Well, they're just planting, so we don't know their economic harm at this point uh, but we would we would make it available if there's we could even put language in that if, if there is money left over that later on in the summer if the other small farms like fruits and vegetables if they if they uh, find further harm they could they could apply then we haven't got a sunset or anything on when they can apply do we michael uh yes there there is a, a deadline for application but isn't um, it late? pardon me isn't it late in the yes it's it's, it's um uh october yeah so the veggie people are going to know as time goes on how they're doing, and they could apply later on and on a first, on, maybe on a, if we could word it right, if you haven't applied and you're a first time applier, you'd get the first bite at the apple or something. Are we, um, are we, the, the the milk the the cheese makers that are not milking themselves are aren't they eligible or do we have any idea if they're eligible under ACCD or whatever? Yeah, um, I don't uh, see. Right, the restart program under ACCD is pretty broad. Yeah. Um, so yeah. likely yes. But you're gonna you're gonna have well I don't know what the restart program is if, it, if it's about reimbursing economic harm I don't know if they're if they're gonna have that that double dip language. See we well we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to keep the big guys from applying to ACCD because. 
they've taken a $25,000 grant from us, I wouldn't think uh, that they're losing millions. What, what if we, um, what if we just capped the, what if we stopped ratcheting up on the processor so that, you know, 80, 80 grand or something was the, the biggest grant? Would that say, would that be enough to keep our, our proportions a little closer to the 75? I I thought we had a twenty five thousand dollar cap. Didn't you mention that, Anthony? Yes. But then, but then you talked about going to um, a cap based on oh, uh, on, the agency based on the size or the, the right cost of the amount, yeah. reduced by the amount of a raw reduction and appropriation to dairy processors. So Ruth, yeah, on your spreadsheet, I'm looking at you've yeah. taken the 7.5 million which you originally uh, offered. And you've dropped that to 4.5, and then you've taken what was 3.3 and doubled that to 6.3. It seems like there might be middle ground there to move the dairy processors up a little bit and the non dairy. Do we really need 6.3 million for non dairy? I don't know. I, I defer to you guys. I was trying to be uh, responsive to Chris's concerns about the percentages. Well, well here, here's here's a consideration for the for the non dairy. If and this is information from Steve Collier. Um, there's a, approximately seven thousand farms, people that that are basically saying that they get some income from farming, um, and so. Uh, the grant would either have to be very low or it's going to be first come, first serve um, from that program. And it's going to be a thousand bucks right now. Right, yeah, right. Which is very little. So we give a hundred grand to a big cheese maker and we give a thousand bucks to a beef producer. Right. Oh. <laughs> but if you've got one beef or two beef, you're, I think it's two maybe you're in you're in that 7,000 number. You aren't really a beef producer. You're a hobby uh, animal grower for your children or something. Isn't, is there that threshold of half your income or whatever, Michael? Um, so that, that's not in there right now. Uh, <laughs> you, you could do that. Um, That's dangerous doing But that. I thought you had wanted it to be that they are just subject to the RAPs. Okay, that, that's true. That, that also is a bit of a, a, a threshold, right? <laughs> right, but it's a, it's a relatively low threshold um, for beef, if that's what you're looking at. See, if you do the... If you do the uh, the other issue in house coaches, uh, one spouse or the other works off the farm, then okay. you, you know you're kicked out, and and you know they're feeling the hurt too, even though they're small. So I, I just come back to the the if if dairy and dairy processors are about seventy percent of the ag economy. I think we need to have some justification for giving them more than 70% of the money. And maybe the justification is we think they're hurting worse. Exactly. But, hurt, but we have, look, I'm getting a text from rural Vermont saying they've been <laughs> farmers, diversified farmers to testify. And we've only heard from them. So I, I, I just don't have a, that's not true. We heard we've heard from other farmers, I, and they all said, "Yeah, it's been painful, and they've lost market share, and they're had expenses." And they're they're all they're all hurting, Chris. But if you lose the 
the dairy infrastructure, uh, those little guys wouldn't even exist any longer because they wouldn't be able to, if you lose your parts places, tractor places, uh, feed dealers and, and all yeah, those okay. people will end up like New Hampshire uh, driving four hours in one direction to get a part that costs you a uh, hundred bucks. But if you don't have that, you can't get the hay in and it's going to rain. And I mean, it, it's just, it's just so important to maintain the infrastructure that that's why dairy is so important is because it helps keep all this other little dairy alive and, and healthy. That's why I've been willing to go over the 70% that E.B. White testified is, is the, the, the relative amount of the economy. Um, I just think every percentage over their share has, gets trickier. Can I also suggest an idea that Tom's is getting past this the hobby farmers or whatever we want to call them, people with one or two cows, that we set a, a minimum sales requirement to be considered for the money. Like you have to have made $5,000 a year for the previous year or something like that. You have to generate income. You have an income threshold in order to qualify. So that way, if somebody just has one or two cows or one or two cattle, it's not necessarily going to, qual it's not going to qualify for the money. Mm -hmm. Well, that would shorten up that 7,000 number for sure. Or make it right. go further. Right, make it go further. Make it go to the people who need it more, too. You know, you could do something along the lines of, um, like, for the, for the cheese, you could be, like, produces more than 250,000 or 250 pounds per day. And then you could have a cap at the high end at, like, 100,000 per day. You could save a couple hundred thousand off the top end. I mean, right now this has those grants to cheesemakers going up to a hundred grand. Yeah, so you could cap it at a hundred thousand, right? Or cap the fifty to a hundred thousand in the category per day, and just cap everything above a hundred thousand per day at seventy five, seventy five thousand, and then that kind of frees up about two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the, because, you're, because you're cutting that, you're reducing them. Sorry, you're reducing those by twenty five thousand each times four. How about a hundred thousand? I'm just saying you 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 can scrunch the ends. You don't have to you don't have to use these categories that are presented to us. We can lump categories together. We can cut out categories. We have minimums. We have maximums. Like we don't have to use the ten thousand to fifty thousand per day. We can do ten thousand to a hundred thousand per day and break out a cricket grant category in that. Yeah. The only, thing, losers, but... uh, the only thing we need to watch out for there is there's some very uh, small sheep uh, producers uh, and, and goats that only make maybe 10 pounds or 20 pounds of cheese uh, on a certain day of the week or two days a week and they go to the farmer markets on the weekend with their 20 or 30 pounds and get, you know, 20 bucks a pound for it or whatever. And they, you know, they get by. So we wouldn't want to lock them out if they're actually losing money. Well, they well, they get up to $25,000, right? Under this proposal right now. Yeah. Well, it would under this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How, how did we? Um, how did we start at twenty five thousand? That that seems like a big number. We're giving a, a small dairy eleven thousand two hundred fifty. I I just was putting numbers in there, trying to back in the total amount and and sort of trying to stay with the concept of giving more to the smaller guys. But I can move the numbers to whatever you want to make it all fit. That's the beauty of a spreadsheet. No, I understand. I just- I, But I just, you went, where that number came from, it's, it's you started with the administration's proposal and then you reduced it by basically whatever the reduction is currently right now. Yeah. So they, they started with 25 to the smallest cheese makers? No, they started with higher than that. 
Okay. They started with 56. Yeah, they were all. But they also had fit $10 million <laughs> proposal versus right. 4.5 right now. So, um, you know, I we can do a minimum and a maximum, and then I can adjust the interim ones to whatever makes sense. And I think Nolan's right. I'm combining some of these categories will make it easier. So we have maybe three yeah. categories or four categories instead of six. Um, and then I would uh, recommend that you do that and and you use uh, you you add up the dairy and make sure that's up toward 19 and use the rest uh, to to cap out or put minimums in or or maximums and work that way. You know, I, I have an idea too, um, because you, I think you only have 13 minutes left. If you give Ruth and I some guidance in terms of percentages and some basics, we can come back tomorrow with some scenarios. Yeah. Rather than us just go back and forth and kill 13 minutes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think we can do that. The, the, the best thing is just to decide on the, the big categories. And yeah. that, you know, if we're going to do 19 million, 4.5, 6.3, and then exactly. 200,000, then we can back into the numbers. But but well, I feel like we need to leave today pretty solid on how we're divvying up the bigger pot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, if you if you start at the top, we have thirty. We keep nineteen for dairy. That end of it. That that leaves you eleven million to d divvy up between. Uh, the other producers and and uh, non dairy um, people and VHCB. What are the percentages? What would the percentages be in that scenario? Like, what does non dairy get as a percentage of the? They're on that rate? spreadsheet that Ruth has. So at this point, if you do fourteen million and four point five, that's that's seventy eight point three percent. For which? For dairy total, like the dairy processors and producers. So non-dairy is close to 25%? 21. It's Yeah, it's 21 point, and if you add in the VHCB thing, 21.7%. But I thought, Nolan, you were going to play with those numbers to, uh, to move them around in different uh, categories to cover yeah i think i think if you give us some guidance in terms of in my head the percentage of how many you want if you if we stick with the dairy at 19 million that's 63.3 for the rest of it right now the, the, the dairy process and cheese makers are 15 and the non dairies are 21 so you give us some guidance in those areas and vhcb is 0.67 but that's only because it's 200,000 if you give us some guidance, I think that we can we can come back with some ideas. I think that's, in my opinion, maybe Ruth thinks well, I would want to at least different. keep the non-dairy as close to 25% as possible. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, yeah. And it's a 21 right now, and you, you don't have any room to move. It's at 6.3. Chris, what well, are you thinking in terms? Well, I, well, I guess I, 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 there is, I mean, 25% seems we were there for a minute. We were trying to figure it out. So a quarter of it's for non-dairy. All of this is based in need. So I, I, I think you could do that by trimming back um, the amount that the large producer gets or some other way. But, but it seems to go to 75% for dairy, I think is... You know, we can we can trim back on the producer sides, but we need to know the not the total amount so that. When you say producer, do you mean processor? Though, just saying. Either way, producer or processor, depending yeah. on the category we're talking about. Because I think we could cap the big processors somewhere. Absolutely. So we could play with that cap. I mean, 
Obviously, we can cut them. But we need to know the total that we're giving to cheesemakers and the total for dairy farmers, and then the total oh. for non-dairy. So I would I would boost the non-dairy a little bit and take out some from the processors so that non-dairy is getting a quarter, and the processors, uh, you know, get trimmed back, but but keep the basic structure of what we have, which benefits the small processors. Right. So, I mean, that goes to, I think, um, well, that's gonna take, well, that's gonna take a lot out of the cheese makers. If we're if we're sticking on the 19 million for dairy, for the yeah. farmers, some of the the little cheesemakers. I mean, even if you added in Jasper Hills, uh, you know, they're pretty large cheesemaker. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I think they're going to be covered well. Um, the way we've got it set up, where they can apply. Uh, you know, either way, in some cases, if they run two corporations, and if they don't, they can add all their losses up as, as one loss. Uh, so they, they'd be able to count both. That. So, so the agency has just said for the non, the non dairy processor, the non milk producer, they're concerned about setting the threshold so that it's it's about people who are actually producing um, items for sale as opposed to the recreational farmer. So, in what category, Michael? The in the non dairy farm mm -hmm. operations. Well, that, you you could write that in, right, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that allows us to get a more a, a, an actual grant, not a not an embarrassment. Jack. So does that does that, Michael? Does that imply considering what I said before about the um, an annual sales amount as a threshold for eligibility? I, I think you could do that. I think if you if you set a a, a minimum income from sales from the farm, that would probably do a lot to address that that concern. That, that makes sense yeah. to me, obviously. Like my neighbor makes honey, but he's a state worker. He doesn't need a grant for his honey operation. No. That's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about. But the beef producer, the you know, the meat producers, the the significant vegetable operations, I don't want to just say here's a thousand bucks. I I, I so whoever's manipulating the spreadsheet, you've satisfied me with the big amounts, um, assuming we can make that real for the cheese makers. I'll just point out what we've done on the spreadsheet is to completely reverse where we started. <laughs> Originally, we had 7.5 for the dairy processors and 3.3 for non-dairy. And now we have her completely the other way around. I still think it's light on the dairy. But, but it's it's five percent more than they represent in the economy. So yeah, but in a normal economy, Chris, I don't think this is a normal economy. And you're using one person's numbers. Well, I okay, the state expert on dairy. I mean <laughs> um, look, I, if you can bring forward some data that counters that. That's fine. We'll talk about it. We're already, but I just don't know how we, I mean, we've just spent decades, you know, amplifying dairy over other kinds of producers. And it's this, which this continues, by the way, this is, I mean, <laughs> you, yeah, you you, <laughs> you have to keep the core of your business healthy and well, or all your other little businesses falter. 
And so we're giving that, them 75% of this money. Well, we, we had 20 million more that came out of the ag department that was gonna be handed out much differently than where we are. And, and I think we've included more people, covered more areas and, and $20 million less money uh, to accomplish uh, our goal. And, and, but you, um, you, can't, you can't starve the core of your, of your enterprise and think you're going to keep the little satellites all rolling well. Uh, Ruth? How about, um, sorry. My family's like trying to get me to come kill a wasp for them. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, I'm the bug killer in the house. Um, but the uh, uh, brain, um, can we, uh, Nolan can mess with these numbers um, yeah. and, and I can help him or talk to him about it. But, and why don't we sleep on it and talk about it tomorrow? Um, I'm feeling like completely, uh, burnt on this conversation. No offense <laughs> to any of you, but I, I, I think I need to take a break. And I also have to get ready to report that livestock. Yes. So I need to make sure I understand it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so could I just summarize what you've asked for in the draft? Yeah. You, you've asked first to take this, the food and the nutrition programs out and put that separate. Yeah. You've asked to, to combine the dairy pro or take the dairy processors out and separate them from the other agricultural processors. You want no double dipping. You want, um, you want the records to be uh, trade secrets when they're referring to um, production and sales, etc. cetera. Uh, and you want VHCB's language to go in with Ellis Change and with their um, VHCB authority. And then for the other ag processors, you want a minimum income threshold for them to qualify for the grant. Um, you haven't talked about what that threshold would be. Um, Here's it for I producers, think. Michael. Not pro not, you said processors, I think it's producers. Well, it's both. It's ag producers. Right. Okay. Now I hear you. Right. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Right. So, and don't forget the repeal language. That's that's that, that's already in. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we do encourage double dipping for the very small producers that are right. Also right. Right. So we don't want to call it that. Right. It's it's. Each, if you have a corporate entity that's a, a producer and a processor, you apply for those different corporate entities. If you have one, you get to apply for both, but only up to the total amount of your economic arm. Yeah. Okay. So for the threshold, the income threshold, could, I mean, NOFA would say $10,000 is an income threshold. And we can start there and see how it goes. Okay. Sounds like a lot to me, but. Well, it's. Probably what five beef or six beef if you quartered them. So, okay. All right. uh, anything else from anybody? What time if, are we meeting tomorrow? Uh, nine o'clock. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And Can hopefully, we prepare to vote on this and get it done. I'm sick of this. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Um, so anyways, we'll see you all in about an hour. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you in the morning. Uh, see you later. Thank you. Yeah.